Welcome to our webinar on prisons and parole during the pandemic. Um, today's panel is made up of Sean Bevan from Pump Court Chambers, who specialises in criminal law, prison law and professional discipline. Also with us, we have Killian Moran from Kesser & Co, who specialises in public law, civil liberties, human rights, dispute resolution and inquests. Also with us today is Beth Jackson, who is also at Kesser & Co and specialises in public law, civil liberties, human rights, disputes and inquests. Today's webinar, we will split into two topics. We will first cover the impact of the pandemic uh, on the prison estate and the criminal justice system. And then we will move on to talk about uh, the parole system during the pandemic. Um, so firstly, we'll start off with the problems in the prison estate and the effect on the criminal justice system. But just by way of some background, um, there's a total of 117 prisons in England and Wales, of which there is approximately 83,000 prisoners within, each, within all of the prisons. The majority of prisons are significantly overpopulated. And at the start of the pandemic, there was the new... Uh, the new guidance that came into place for early release, it was supposed to alleviate the strain on the systems a little bit, but unfortunately, out of 4,000 eligible prisoners, only 275 prisoners were released under the scheme. Um, so it's clear that unfortunately, the scheme was not taken advantage of. Out of 4,000 people, only a tiny fraction were released and the system today continues under significant strain. The scheme has now actually been suspended and no more prisoners are being released under the scheme. Um, so I don't know whether any of the other panel members would like to join in there. Um, Quite happy to jump in actually. Um, so there were some issues at the beginning of the pandemic where there were predictions that were being put out about sort of what would happen if COVID got into prisons and we all saw those really sort of devastating news articles uh, about the cruise ships and the, the numbers of people that had to go effectively into confinement in their cabins uh, and there was quite a lot of research that was done about the prospect of that happening again within the United Kingdom prison estates effectively. As a result of that what the, the measures that were taken um, were really quite stringent and they've had quite an impact on many people that, that would be our clients in their day-to-day -day lives. So effectively, we're in a position now where we're hearing a lot that, that prisoners are being locked up in solitary confinement for up to 23 hours a day in some prisons. Uh, as Alejandra has already explained, um, that there was an issue with overcrowding before um, the national lockdown for the pandemic came in, and this has only exacerbated the issue. One of the particular areas I can lend a little bit of information on is with regard particularly to children, young people uh, that are within the criminal justice system and within the prison estate at the moment, because obviously this is an issue across the board for prisoners, but there are certain groups for whom it's a greater issue. Uh, and I would certainly identify children and young people as being a group that is being disproportionately affected by the changes that have come into the prison estate. So just to give an indication, um, children and young people within prisons have a particularly difficult time anyway, not only just because of their young age, but it tends to be the place where self-harm for example is what is at its highest um, and a number of young people that find themselves uh, incarcerated either have mental health problems of their own many have learning difficulties uh, and other and other issues um, anyone that's ever dealt with, with youth clients will, will know um, that that is quite common coming through the system of course because of the stringent lockdown that has, that has come in across the prison estate. This is indiscriminate between adults and children alike. Uh, and there are many reports. Uh, I know that the Howard League has put an awful lot out, um, and this is publicly accessible information, um, that many of the therapies have effectively stopped, that there's little to no access to, to, to proper education. Um, and as a result of that, um, 
the, the question mark really is over whether the government uh, and indeed the system is able to provide what we would call a detention and training order. The clue is in the name. And it would seem that, that much of the training element uh, of those orders are, are, are not really in place at the moment. Um, yeah, so interestingly, in regards to what you've just been saying, um, AB and the Secretary of State for Justice has just been granted permission to um, go to the Supreme Court. Now, um, the court previously decided that children who were locked up for 22 hours a day with no access to education, and they were doing this for significant periods of time, so like 100 days, that was found to be in breach of Article 8. Um, so obviously Article 8 is qualified right, so it would be open to the government in this scenario to raise a defence that it was proportional in the circumstances. Um, it's just going to be interesting to see if the Supreme Court makes a comment on this and um, how lenient the judges are going to be in regards to how much, how proportionate they should be during the, the lockdown and how whether education should be given to children now that we're starting to ease the restrictions a little bit and like obviously children are going back to school, maybe people in prison should be again restarting their education again now. Yeah I, th I think that's a really good point about AB for, for anyone who isn't um, for who more leans towards uh, crime and civil liberties I think Beth covered it briefly a AB was was a, a challenge uh, brought by a protected party a child at the time I think supported by and someone will correct me if I'm wrong on this uh, the uh, Equality and Human Rights Commission uh, and the real battleground of that case was all about the proportionality of the, 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 the decision to lock up uh, for not extended periods of time children, uh, which is what we're continuing to do in, in this country, um, but without any access to the regime. Uh, I, as Beth said, I, th I think it yeah, will be really interesting to see if, uh, if the, the Supreme Court wants to confront the elephant in the room, which is the fact that although the, the High Court and Court of Appeal found the exact, I mean, a lockup which is less, was less restrictive uh, in terms of time than we've seen at the moment, that they found that to be unlawful. Uh, I, I would look forward to legal arguments on that with, with some interest. Uh, aside from uh, children, the, the other class of people we're seeing uh, that, that this, uh, that the situation in prisons has a really disproportionate effect on anyone that has uh, clients in prison uh, will know this. It is it's people with, with disabilities. Uh, uh, Beth and I currently have uh, a, a handful of clients who uh, we are at the risk of giving away. <laughs> so our litigation strategy uh, who, who all suffer from uh, autism. And what we're finding is that there are a lot of uh, people for whom the extended lockdown in, in the prison, the, the, the 23, 23 and a half hours a day locked in one cell, uh, is our, our clients who suffer from autism it, it, are finding it incredibly difficult to manage this. And, and, and I, I would, uh, I, I think it's fair to say there are going to be a series of uh, private or and or public law uh, claims being brought in respect of that, the 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 twenty three the twenty three hour lockdown it 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 is it, something that, that the government is going to have to contend with at some point uh, because uh, although it's being lifted occasionally in some prisons, pr different prisons are having, in our experience, different approaches to this. Uh, some re regimes are less restrictive, some regimes are more restrictive. Uh, for my uh, my best guess is that. Uh, Anyone working in a, in, with, with clients who are in detention that has any civil liberties department will be preparing or ha have already issued uh, a, a series of uh, discrimination complaints, uh, claims of discrimination rather, um, because that's, that's the overwhelming amount of work that we're seeing coming out of this issue. Ali, did you want to pick up something on the 23 hour? Ali, I think your mic's still off. Oh, I am. Sorry about that. <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> um, from the 23rd of March, the Lord Chief Justice announced that no more jury trials would be taking place until it was safe to do so. And from that date, the country also went into lockdown. And unfortunately, it also meant that prisoners had to go into lockdown because of the close proximity of cells and the overcrowding within the prison estate. What that meant 
is that at the time and and still now actually there, there was no safe there were no safety measures put in place to ensure that prisoners could adequately be seen or see their families or be seen by their legal advisors many prisoners now are finding themselves under 23 to 23 and a half hour lockup each day with very limited access to things like showers social time physical activity because of the close proximity in which they are in within the prisons uh, it was described that this disease this disease is a, a crowd disease because of the way in which it spreads and unfortunately because of the state of prisons and the way in which they are built and the fact that they're overcrowded it means that the coronavirus thrives in the prison environment unfortunately we are now finding, and I'm sure that both on the solicitor and the barrister side, the situation is the same, that we are unable to see clients, to give them the legal advice that they need to ensure that their cases are progressing fairly. What, so what this means in terms of court is that cases are being adjourned because clients are not in a position to be arraigned, defence statements are not being able to be prepared, Barristers as well as solicitors are going along to courts without instructions and this is putting even an even further strain on the system. Now I'd be interested to see whether any civil action is brought um, by way of judicial review as to how this is being handled because in my view it's incredibly unfair for CTLs to continue being extended without trial dates being set and we're almost mirroring the American system whereby accused are detained for what could be months on end, years on end, without the prospect of a trial date coming up in the near future. But we're also in a position where people are being detained awaiting sentence, where their sentences can't be listed in the near future because they can't be brought to prisons. In some of the women's prisons in the UK, there's also the further issue that when they're being brought out of prison to go into, into court, they have to go back and quarantine. And unfortunately, the prison estate is just not big enough to split the inmates from those who are quarantining for two weeks upon their return from court and those who are serving their sentences and ultimately waiting for their upcoming hearings. Something has to change because it's, it's not right that we have people awaiting trial who are supposed to be innocent until proven guilty, waiting and sat waiting in a prison under 23 to 23 and a half hour lockup without a prospect of a trial date in the future. It's not the prisoner's fault that the system is significantly underfunded and essentially on, on, the, on the brink of, of collapse because of the underfunding. And it's not fair that because of that, that they are having to wait longer and longer for their for their trials or their hearings to come up. Uh, I think I think there's a, several really really interesting points that come directly out of what you've said there. I'm just going to touch on the CTL thing point briefly um, because I had a a dive around Westlaw for cases which concerned remand time and I. I'm now more confused than ever. I, I think it, it was, it, I find it really strange that the public law challenge hasn't been, hasn't been brought about this already. Um, and then I started reading the cases and I sort of figured out why, or why I think a public law challenge hasn't been brought. There seems to be conflicting authority as to whether the, any judicial review of a, because it would have to be of, a, of the court itself to refuse to grant a bail or, or extend the CTL is uh, justiciable in the first place. But what was quite remarkable is, is the number of challenges that haven't been brought. I think the statistics I saw when I last looked at them, you've got, I think it's something along the lines of 30,000 backlogged Crown Court trials. Uh, one of the criminal barristers will correct me if I'm wrong. And this sounds like the more outlandish number, but I still think it's right. Half a million backlogged magistrates court trials. I see nodding. That's good. My numbers are right. Um, in respect of, if we just, if we just take the Crown Court trials, uh, where, where there's more likely to be some kind of remand, I couldn't see any case, and, and 
so there might be someone in the in the audience rolling their eyes and saying, "Oh, we've forgotten about this case." But but I couldn't see any case which which even attempted to involve uh, the Secretary of State for Justice, which I found really bizarre, because it seems to me that, that there's a there's a broader procedural issue. Um, well, sorry, a broader not procedural policy issue that that court sitting times are are have been cut back. Judges aren't being paid to sit, that there just isn't enough time to deal with criminal cases. And it's the world's worst kept secret that that's leading to additional remand time. The only judicial reviews I could find that, um, that dealt with that, one said that the, the issue just simply wasn't justiciable. Uh, that was a 2017 case, AF and Kingston Crown Court. But that related to the decision to bail post conviction. So not strictly relevant. And there was a case in 2015, uh, which I don't have, uh, which, which did seem to at least grapple with the issue and was quite critical. I think it might have been, the, might have been a jail of the Central Criminal Court. The, but in any event, the, the, the High Court seemed to indicate that, that it would be the, 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 the regular extension of the CTL was at least in principle, something they could look at. I think the case failed, but for reasons which were to do with its facts that we almost certainly don't have time to get into. The broader point I think I take is that, that what surprised me was the absence of challenges, and especially the absence of recent challenges. And for the, if there are any uh, criminal lawyers watching or, or, or watching later, I, I, I think there, there is a broader policy question as to, as to what should lawyers do about, about the um, about the about a collateral attack on the on the policy that's led to this situation? Now, of course, any such challenge is in just about the worst political uh, climate to do so, given that we're the, given that judicial review is directly under attack. But I, I, I wonder if the lack of judicial reviews is is because of a, a, a lack of, of, uh, of criminal lawyers that, that, that do either do judicial review or work in departments where they have uh, uh, close colleagues that do judicial review and the kind of lack of joined up thinking between civil and crime. Um, I think, Sean, you, want, you wanted to say something about recent uh, yeah, I'm just going to jump in a little bit with, with some of the case law that you were talking about. Certainly, I think your point about there not being recent case law, I would agree with, but, but one of the interesting things that has come out and is certainly creating a bit of buzz in the, in the crime world with regard to the, the CTL uh, applications and extensions that have pretty much just been being passed as of right, um, given these particularly unprecedented times that we're dealing with with the pandemic, was quite a... a bold, I suppose you could say, decision at Woolwich Crown Court uh, recently, in which the judge refused effectively to find that lack of court availability, lack of sitting judges, a, a restriction, if you will, on the court estate could be considered a good and sufficient cause for extending a custody time limit. And in quite a reasoned judgment, if anybody hasn't looked at this, I really would advise it, particularly if you are, are within the criminal law at the cold face, having to deal with clients that, that might be facing this. Um, it was a, a, a as the case of uh, Norwich Crown Court ex party Stiller back in 1992, where a lack of, of courtroom and a lack of judge was uh, considered not a good and sufficient cause, um, particularly where no extension would have been granted had the facilities been available. And I think now that we're starting to live, if we can call it in the post COVID age, not to say that the pandemic isn't an issue anymore, but to say that we're sort of living with the fallout rather than living in the midst of the lockdown. A lot of the issues that the court estate is having, it is dealing with the backlog whilst trying to maintain, as they must, uh, safe COVID compliant environments. And naturally that means just 
isn't physically uh, enough space in terms of courtrooms to hear these cases but, but that is an authority um, that, that has been cited by a Crown Court judge um, albeit dating back from the 90s and there's another case which was ex party Marsden again dating back to 1992 where it was stated that reliance placed on a lack of for example a suitable judge or a suitable courtroom um, it wasn't enough to say that there was a clash with another case and that therefore effectively you've got two cases competing for one set of facilities but it was necessary for the crown to show why the other case should have priority so certainly if, if we're going to get to a, a position where courts are trying to prioritize cases into a who should go first and this that and the other and you uh, and your client find yourself perhaps on the losing side of that then it, it might be worth considering uh, some of these slightly older cases and certainly um albeit in an unpublished judgment at the Woolwich Crown Court uh Her Honour Judge Rayner did uh, refuse to grant uh, a custody time limit extension on that um, and I would suggest that these could be quite um, sort of powerful arguments particularly that, that it's generally considered that a lack of money given by Parliament will rarely if ever justify an extension and, and I think we can all agree working in, in criminal justice or, or a variation thereof uh, dealing with the prison estate that in a lot of cases investment is desperately needed and many of the problems could be maybe not cured but certainly alleviated um, with an additional injection of funds so um, it would suggest particularly in cases I would think where we're dealing with multi-handed cases because they are becoming particularly difficult to accommodate in, in COVID friendly courtrooms and the introduction of the Nightingale courts just haven't been big enough or expansive enough um, to ensure that they are likely to get on in a timely fashion so I would say that these are cases worth looking at if you are facing a custody time limit extension uh, in those sorts of, of cases. Um, just picking up from where Sean left off, um, the CTL guidance that was provided um, as a result of the pandemic, the whole point of it was to provide some framework for the efficient and expeditious handling of cases. Now, this guidance was handed down by senior, senior members of the judiciary uh, and HMCTS, and that's where I feel that the problem lies, because the whole point of the guidance, and I, and I can't stress enough that it's supposed to be guidance not statute it's guidance uh, but unfortunately because of the, the way that this guidance has been passed down and the fact that it was written by the SPJ it, it, it appears that it has somewhat limited the ability of judges to apply this guidance because they are essentially their hands are tied they have to follow the law from the courts above and for many judges in the Crown Court, it becomes extremely difficult to exercise any form of discretion when this is the guidance that has been provided by significantly more senior members of the judiciary. Perhaps the better way that this could have been handled um, would have been by way of a statutory instrument and that would have really given members of the judiciary, especially in the lower courts, the ability to exercise any form of discretion without uh, hindering or putting without hindering perhaps the relationship within the judiciary or their positions as members of the judiciary I just feel that perhaps that the way that the guidance was prepared was not appropriate because essentially it, it ties the hands of the lower court of the lower court judges and instead the way that it should have been done should have been by way of a statutory instrument or some form of emergency legislation to allow for that independence of the branches of our society, the independence from the executive and the judiciary, because at the moment, unfortunately, it appears to me that the circuit judges in the Crown Court are left with no real choice and no real ability to exercise any discretion as to whether or not to extend the CTLs without getting themselves into trouble from, for essentially going away from what senior members of the judiciary have ruled. Um, now, another problem that's been um, occurring in the system has been the limited access to legal advice. And I know that Beth um, will jump in at this point. Um, yes. Yeah. So at the start of lockdown, um, 
I tried to book numerous video links, telephone conferences with my clients in order to take quite urgent instructions in some cases. I was advised numerous times over and over again that video link was not available until four months, three months down the line, um, and that there was no other way that I could get in contact with my client other than writing into them or getting them to call me um, using their own credit. Um, it's problematic for all offenders trying to take their instructions that way but particularly problematic for those with um, disabilities and those offenders who cannot read or write so i have um, a client with severe learning difficulties and he struggles to understand substantially large amounts of information um, and i needed to take his detailed instructions it was initial instructions as well regarding what he wanted me to do for his parole reps um, I was unable to get a video link, I was unable to get a telephone conference. It took me writing to the parole board and trying to go and get a direction from the parole board for me to get a telephone conference with the client and this caused significant delays in me being able to actually take his instructions and submitting representations on his behalf. Um, as a result, the representations were submitted two months down the line from when they should have been submitted um, and obviously that has caused significant delay to him. Um, I know that they are now um, trying to stop the use of telephone conferences as well as a substitute for video links. They're saying that video links are the only priority now. And that, um, but whenever we've tried to book a video link since, we've still getting dates like October is the earliest date that we'll be allowed to um, have a video link for our client. I'm hoping to just jump in on, on some of the, the issues that you've obviously touched upon, Beth, and that you've clearly had what sounds like a quite soul-destroying experience in trying to, to get hold of clients. I can certainly say that I've had a not dissimilar situation occur over the lockdown, but this was through the extradition courts. And generally speaking, extradition has been able to carry on quite a bit better than quite a lot of the criminal justice system, mostly because various hearings have been able to go remote. Uh, they don't require a jury, obviously, in the same way that the criminal trials would. But but one of the points um, that, that you've mentioned there about having access to clients has been a, a particular bugbear. And it actually came to the point a little like you have had to get a direction from the parole board. Um, I was left in a position where effectively there was no option but to ask uh, at a hearing for which the uh, prison video link was was not facilitated by the prison for a further mention hearing to be listed for the requested person to be produced um, so that effectively parties could meet because there had been no other way in which instructions could be taken and I would say it's not ideal and it's not the most desirable situation but some form of judicial activism in that side can be quite helpful if, if the lawyers can can get on it list matters for mention with a view um, to having clients produced then that may be a way at least in the short term of circumventing some of the difficulties that we're finding behind the scenes and certainly I had a district judge that would was, was more more than prepared to do this but it certainly seems to be an issue that's going right up to the upper echelons of of, of all areas um that, that's related to the criminal justice system i was reading in the news um that in fact even julian assange's case is being delayed to november which i think many people would consider to probably be the extradition case of the century simply because uh, it's being raised at Westminster magistrates that his lawyers have been unable to get any access to him uh, and certainly I think listing mentions that the drawback of course of this is that there are additional hearings that are having to go into the list and also the concern about lawyers or, or others filling the courts for the purposes really of conferences uh, as well as case updates and that doesn't really help with the COVID safety plans that many of the court staff will have worked tirelessly to try and put into place but the, the reality seems to be as undesirable as it is that this is one of the only ways to make lawyers and clients be able to communicate and to keep cases on some semblance of a timetable. I think from what we've been saying that there's a well, I mean, everyone that works in the criminal justice system or tangential to it, as, as all four of us do, uh, or in or tangential, knows that most of these problems, well, most of not all of these problems were existed before coronavirus. And all coronavirus has really sought to do is shine a massive light on the cracks that already existed. Um, my view for what it's worth um, is, is that it, it for example, what we were just talking about, the access to clients, there's, there's a room for 
uh, there's, well, there's room for public law here to, to provide some kind of solution, whether you are a civil practitioner or a criminal practitioner. Um, anyone that works, especially in prison, I think, was aware of this before coronavirus, that sometimes with some prisons in some urgent cases, the only way to get a, um, get a conference at short notice was by threatening judicial review. I've done it at least twice um, in the uh, in in the six to eight months uh, leading up before coronavirus lockdown prisons. Uh, I had in, in in another particularly notable case, I, I had a a client we just simply couldn't take instructions from because he had a, a, a visual impairment, and we we threatened to uh, to jr the the. Secretary of State and suddenly a solution was found and I think prisons have always been quite reactive to that and I know um, from speaking to fellow lawyers that work in prisons that that's always been a a, 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 a tactic that's available to people and I, I think I, I wonder if uh, criminal lawyers, uh, solicitors and barristers alike might consider using uh, what at least threatening judicial review or, or similar actions in, in, in certain cases to get the proceed, sort of get the procedure, keep the procedure ticking over so that there can be effective hearings. Um, actually, I've just looked at the chat and um, yeah, I, I can see how that would be the experience of some people because it, it does tend to be done on a prison by prison basis. For anyone who hasn't seen the chat, um, Ray Collins has said that uh, only a couple of this has been, only been an issue in a couple of uh, prisons and only two hearings have been delayed or adjourned. I think, again, anyone that works in prisons will kind of recognize that experience because the, the amount of autonomy given to prison governors, um, occasionally you get a complete sort of heart of darkness prison governor who just d does it his or her own way. And, um, and, and, yeah, my, my favourite solution to everything, threaten to judicially review them. Um, my, my broad observation, I think this will uh, perhaps segue us as, uh, in, into, the, uh, into the second half of the talk, is that there seems to be a massive disparity between people working in the, the, the criminal coalface and people uh, who do parole hearings or work with the parole board, which is strange because they are two sides of the same coin. And yet, uh, for various reasons, they seem to operate in in completely different ways, and there's been completely different approaches to how uh, technology and remote uh, hearings can be used. Um, I, I know, well, Sean and I at least have had a, a, a remote parole hearing, um, and it went not terribly badly. <laughs> the one we did together. So, what 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 are your thoughts on that? Personally, my thought was obviously having done both and, and you're explaining about potentially a discrepancy between the parole side of things and the, and the crime side of things. Considering this was done, our, our particular example was done right in the height of the lockdown. It was, a, it was an April listing um, and it was done over the telephone. The biggest issue that, that we really faced um, was to do with effectively the, the parole dossier that had been disclosed to us was not the most up-to-date version and it took a little bit of time certainly with people not being in the same room to realize this and to have it rectified but on the whole I would say that this was was quite a successful experience and certainly compared to some of the delays and technological failings that have happened certainly on both Skype for Business and the CVP system that is existing for remote hearings in in the criminal courts, generally speaking, um, that the parole experience was more pleasant and I would say more successful having compared the two. I would say the hardest part from an advocate's perspective um, was not so much uh, the questioning of, of witnesses uh, in the sense that it tends to be a more sort of inquisitorial system than, than the adversarial elements of crime that we see, but certainly taking detailed instructions um, and client management, I think I will have said over the phone, was more challenging because you don't build that rapport. I was fortunate that I have at least met the client that we were dealing with face to face in the past, but I think it would have been very difficult to gain the trust of this individual uh, and indeed many individuals that are coming up to parole, which is an enormous decision um, 
uh, for their future. I think that would have been particularly challenging to try and achieve over the phone and it's not therefore ideal but when the discussion is between it not being ideal and somebody potentially having to have their parole hearing adjourned into you know way into the future uh, I would say that this was a, a workable alternative given um, the particular circumstances we were dealing with at the time. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. oh, oh, sorry. Uh, after... um, there you go. No, I, I was just going to make a very brief point, saying uh, that the I, I think that in that narrow respect, that the, the pro board were quite quick off the mark um, with getting some kind of infrastructure in place for remote and telephone hearings, which the criminal courts have seemed really resistant to do. Um, so in, in that respect, not I, I, cause, because I'm usually suing the problem, I, I don't commend them a lot, but that, for that they should be commended because it, it was fairly swift and it, 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 um, it has carried on with some degree of normality, which can't be said, the same can't be said for all other courts. Um, so what were you coming in with there? Oh, I was just going to say, so it, it's quite clear that it obviously has been quite successful for a lot of um, prisoners and that it's been quite easy to transition to the video and kind of telephone conferences as a hearing. Um, what it seems to be a big problem with, though, is the failure to consider how individuals with disabilities and individuals with expressive difficulties will cope in a situation where they have to just talk to the phone or they're over the video link with a lag or, for example, um, I have a client with learning difficulties and when he was advised that his, video, uh, his oral hearing was going to take place via video link, he told me that he would not be able to do it, that he, don't, he, doesn't, he didn't think that he would be able to engage properly with the panel members, he would get very frustrated and this would show and he wouldn't be able to answer questions to the best of his ability. So what I did is I approached the um, panel about this and I made them aware of my client's concerns. What the result was, was it was simply just adjourned um, with no plan as to what was going to happen. Um, we raised with them the fact that the CEO for the parole board had recently released a recovery plan which was suggesting that some essential face-to-face -face hearings were going to take place. We went back to them and asked them whether this would classify as an essential oral hearing um, and whether they could consult with the prison in regards to this to see if it was like feasible to do. It appeared that they had not consulted the prison before saying that they were not able to commit to doing an oral hearing and then they subsequently asked if this was feasible. It turned out it wasn't in the end anyway, but that sort of just, there wasn't a re resolution to it. It's sort of just been parked for the minute to just wait until the, the prison can let us in again. And there's not really been a consideration as to how this is impacting the client himself. Um, yeah. Yeah, so we've, um, that's, a, that's a case we're currently bringing because it, in, um, in what's becoming a theme of every time I open my mouth here, um, well, our answer to that is, is just judicially review everything. It, it, in, that, in that case, it's actually pretty interesting because I, I, um, we know that right at the top of the agenda of the parole board is the experience of people with uh, uh, disabilities. Uh, the, reason, the reason I know that is because I was just part of a case where uh, the parole board lost the judicial review, um, which concerned the uh, the ability of people who lack mental capacity to engage with the parole board. Uh, that I think, in the, in the course of that litigation, the the there was a a lot of evidence about the number of people who appear before the parole board who have uh, learning difficulties, mental health problems, and the the suggestion was made that a lot of, well, there, there, at least some people, it's kind of hard to quantify the, the number of people, but that there are people going through the parole war process unrepresented uh, or not able to represent themselves or who are having, who are struggling with this for, for some substantial reason relating to a disability who just slipped through the net. And this new case was, was a, was an example of that. We're, we're our clients suggesting that there, there hasn't really been a lot of thought given uh, about how the continued cancellation of all face-to-face -face hearings is is affecting 
uh, people with disabilities that simply just for whatever reason cannot uh, appear by telephone, can't appear by video link and just find it too stressful or, or too difficult to express themselves. And so I, th I think that's a very much a watch this space. And I think, I think the theme of if I have a sort of single um, message to put across throughout, throughout this talk, it, it's to say that the, the, the experience of people who, who have disabilities is being sidelined uh, in, in these processes. And it's, it's a real concern and then something more has to be done. Um, what are other people's? Can I possibly jump in, just looking at this ever so slightly from a, from a criminal lens, because obviously it's really interesting hearing, and, and obviously I also practice in parole, so, so seeing some of the the outcomes um, and how parole has, has worked during COVID. But from the perspective of looking at somebody that is perhaps facing an immediate custodial sentence, I think ensuring that criminal practitioners have a strong understanding of, of what's going on within the prison estate would really help us in the way that we present our mitigation, particularly in cases where it's on the borderline between suspending a sentence and having an immediate custodial. Because whilst I think we can all accept that, that, that a client going to prison is a difficult, punitive, unpleasant experience these additional factors and particularly how they might interact with a client that also has other disabilities or other special needs um, might be something that that is worth putting before the court at a sentencing hearing so that the judge can can fully appreciate um, the gravity and the impact that an immediate custodial sentence at this particular time will have compared with um, for example if this was happening a year two years ago or uh, optimistically thinking um, a couple of years in the future when hopefully we are past this particularly difficult time but I, I would just give an eye to that as a criminal practitioner that, that sort of understanding the realities of the prison estate and the people that are are particularly losing out at the moment because of these these very stringent mess, uh, matters and, and measures that are having to be in at the moment um, could be really helpful and a powerful tool in mitigation. Um, we're just going to leave some of the questions um, to the end, uh, just so that we can just uh, wrap up the discussion. But we will we will address some of the comments in the in the chat function in due course. In terms of of parole, Sean, Killian, Beth, do you feel that there is enough being done to resume in person hearings? In the near future, do you feel that the parole board will be reaching a stage soon where that can be restarted? Yeah, yes and no. I think is the is the um, is the is the answer to that. Anyone who does parole will, will likely have seen the um, CEO of the parole board's recovery plan, uh, which he he has a, a Martin Jones has a blog, which is quite good if you if you practice and parole and their plan at least on paper appears to be the return to a what they're calling a new normal which i suspect is what most public authorities have in mind which um incorporates technology and and, and less uh less face-to-face -face hearings now i suppose this is where we move away from the legal into the political it is that the parole board have a, 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 an incentive that other courts do not to ensure that their hearings are proceeding in some kind of ordered or disordered fashion. So I said the parole board, it was pretty quick off the mark. Now, if I'm, if I'm being a cynic, um, which is more or less why I got into law, um, people who, are, who work in, in, in prison law will be very, very familiar with the, the principle that anyone who is serving an indeterminate sentence of imprisonment is entitled to damages whether they're released or not if their parole hearing is delayed. Now, in the last financial year, um, anyone who, who isn't uh, in, uh, in, involved in, in parole, um, these sums are relatively modest, which means that where in the last financial year the parole board paid about £130,000 in compensation, means that there's still, still a significant financial incentive to not stall everything. 
So are they ready to go back to in-person hearings? No, <laughs> because uh, that they, they don't have the pull in prisons to make that happen as, as, as Beth stated in, 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 in the case she's undertaking. But there, there, there will clearly be a, uh, uh, an incentive, both financial and political, to make sure that hearings do go ahead, things do keep, the, the ball keeps rolling. And like I said, if, if I'm being a cynic, which I'm going to be, I, I, I would suggest that, that it's, it's partly to do with, with uh, minimising financial liabilities and the problems making directions to make things keep, keep going. I think that's uh, perfectly possible. I, I'd certainly there's, it's not really fair to say a running joke, but there is an acceptance, certainly in the criminal law world, that if somebody after a long time on remand uh, has their trial and uh, are found not guilty, the reward is, for the most part, that you get to go home. That there isn't that, that sort of impetus, that financial impetus necessarily to, to move things. And that's not to say that the criminal courts aren't aren't trying um, but it is to say that they face a, a number of challenges um, and that uh, perhaps that that impetus that exists for the parole board just just isn't there in quite the same way sorry I my mic front enough um yeah i agree and, and i think the the if if there is a again another red thread to draw through this this talk it, it's the whilst the, the two sides of the criminal justice system, whilst the magistrates and Crown Court have a bit more power to order things, to keep things going, they're for some reason not willing to use technology, not willing to enable conferences with lawyers, not willing to do things. And it's very much the individual judicial activism or the activism of lawyers in that, the coal face of the criminal justice system to, to keep things moving. Uh, the parole board similarly ha has, of its own volition, kept things moving in a way which the, the magistrates and crown has not to the same extent. But on the flip side of that, it has a very limited power to make any substantive direction order, whatever it may be, when things don't go the way it wants. It occupies a very strange grey area in, in the courts and tribunal system where it doesn't have the inherent jurisdiction of most courts constitutionally, it, it, it's still very unclear what the problem actually is. It, its directions are usually just recommendations. So in that sense, I'd describe it as a bit inert, um, but it's more amenable, more suited, and has been more pra uh, pragmatic in its approach to remote hearings and keeping the ball rolling. Um, which is fairly, I mean, I don't want to say that's a fairly good place to <laughs> sort of uh, end, but, um, that, that's that's my broad thought on, on the matter. Um, what I say is, it, if people do have um, questions, do do feel free to put them in the, the chat. Um, I think our um, tentatively, I'm going to say our email addresses might be somewhere that you can reach. And if if you do have questions that you don't want to put in the chat, but do want to email us about, uh, is is that is that right? Or have I just committed your clerks to something? That is right. Sean will send an email after the webinar just letting you know how you can get in touch with any of us if you have any questions. Um, so do look out for that email and we are all more than happy to answer your questions if you want to just email them through to us. Equally, if you have any questions now, we're more than happy to answer them and maybe put them up in the chat function. So we'll just give it a few minutes and see if there are any questions on the chat function before we call it a day. Uh, there's an interesting point that Ray raises in his last comment saying that the real issue is going to be with those who really need face-to-face -face hearing and that ties back to what you were saying Killian, about them not being quite ready to restart. I suppose this, the same question might be sort of sent back at the, the criminal lawyers. Sean, do you, do you think the, um, the criminal justice system is ready, willing and or able to do any form of remote hearing? <sighs> Oh, as far as, as remote is concerned, less so. I, I think that there are some, shall we say, promising practical considerations. Um, certainly I've heard uh, on the grapevine of the possibility of, of porter cabins being set up to amount to um, sort of jury deliberation rooms to try and get people back physically into the court estate using perhaps less than the three 
individual courtrooms that it often takes to, to run a, a jury trial at the moment. Uh, and I think certainly we, we do quite a lot of work on the Western circuit and I've, I've seen some suggestions in, I think it was Winchester, that the um, sort of plastic barricades that you're seeing in, in shops and in pubs and places like that may be coming in sort of between jurors, um, which, which would uh, assist in getting us physically back to court. Yeah, I, I think unfortunately though just going on from what Sean has said you know we were put into lockdown on the 23rd of March work should have began on the 23rd of March to ensure that measures were put in place so that in-person hearings could resume as soon as possible and unfortunately everything was left until June and now we have an extremely big backlog of cases that we unfortunately do not have the capacity nor the judicial power to tackle um, I think, unfortunately, it has been left too late and it should have been addressed from the, from the get go, from the moment we were locked down, HMCTS and the judiciary should have been looking at what could have been put in place to ensure that we got back up and running as soon as possible. I've just um, seen one question that's come through that I'm quite interested in where it says, are, are, you, are you concerned uh, about the progression delays that will be caused by the, the lack of risk reduction programmes being run? Short answer, absolutely massively, because there are going to be individuals for whom that there are certain requirements on their sentences um, and that they will struggle to show that their risk has reduced in any meaningful way without having completed certain programmes that will have been recommended for them. And it has, I certainly foresee that it would be a concerning but quite likely development of what's happened that people will be I hate to use the word set up to fail but certainly at, at a disadvantage that ordinarily they would have completed various programs before um, being seen by the parole board and having their hearings but they simply won't have had the opportunity to do it and given that, that the parole board are there to balance a risk assessment it's not something whilst it is unfair and of no fault of the prisoners it's not something that you can always demonstrate in other ways um, so I think this is potentially an enormous problem with progressing people through the prison estate and actually dealing with the overcrowding issues um, and seeing people sort of get to the end of their sentence and completing I don't know if anyone else wants to dive in on that. Um, no, just on top of that, so it's not just the progression within the prison estate as well. I know that there's a lot of delay with prisoners who have been directed for release but need to go to an AP. Um, there's currently, because the APs have had to basically reduce to a single bedroom occupancy, this has put more strain than, the, than there already was before on the um, APs. Another point that was raised in one of my paroles was that um, alcohol testing was not being delivered at a certain AP, which was quite problematic for my client because part of his license condition was to be tested for alcohol and to remain um, alcohol free. So it, it just raises concerns as to how quickly they're going to, once that release is directed, and if it is, how quickly they will be able to get out of the prison estate themselves in the current delays that there are. On that same point, there's a, um, there's a human rights duty, uh, Article 5.1 duty called the James duty, that um, uh, some of you may be familiar with. So in, in terms of are, are we concerned by uh, the uh, delays caused by the lack of risk reduction programs being run, I, I think it should also concern the government as well as the parole board um, because it, depending on how long this state of affairs goes on for and, and no, one, no one really seems to have any sensible answer to that, um, you might get a lot of post-tariff prisoners very, very annoyed that they're left in limbo with no effective way to reduce their risk. Um, most of the clients I have, they're, they're, they have no way of engaging in any meaningful risk reduction work, and especially the more complex uh, risk reduction courses that, that you'd expect those more complex cases, complex post-tariff IPP cases to have engaged with. If, if there's outstanding risk reduction work or work that's on their sentence plan that they're not able to do because of the prison regime not operating it's hard to see um how the blame for that could be pinned anywhere other than than the ssj and it, 
those of you who have clients in that position is something to think about as the as the lockdown stretches from weeks to months to who knows how long the restrictive regime is going to be that there's there's no sensible answer as to when it will become unlawful but but it, it, it it's uh there is definitely a when that you can in, in, invite any court to to find um, just looking at the question by Abud Hussein about um, uh, tax cases not being considered remotely, the, di the difficulty, I think, and, I, and this is going back to just complete basics about technology, one of the biggest difficulties with dealing with cases remotely is the fact that internet connection is often crap. There's then also the problem about uh, confidentiality and I say this, and I say this just completely on uh, off the back of a case that I had, completely irrelevant to terrorism, where my client thought that he could appear in court from the middle of Baker Street. Um, so you see, <laughs> there's a lot of difficulties in practical terms and of dealing with cases remotely. And while we're all trying to facilitate um, hearings in order to progress cases quickly remotely that the problem is is that more often than not there is a very limited access to legal advice technology often doesn't work and I, i'm sure that sean will agree with you when i say this there has been there have been many occasions where i have been to court for what i thought was going to be a pre-court conference and the conferences are not being facilitated and i think that we first need to iron out the access to legal advice and the technological issues before we're able to deal with serious um, and, and potentially life-changing cases remotely. I think we ought to iron out the technological issues first and access to legal advice. On that point, I saw, I mean, this, this, this doesn't really relate to ethics and parole, it's just something I spotted on, um, on a blog recently. In sensitive cases, I, I don't think there's any real um, coherent system for, for ensuring that that or safeguarding the the, the very sensitive information. And I get, I, I don't, I don't, can't remember the case on neutral citation for this because it, it's not something I was planning on talking about. But there was a civil case recently subject to reporting restrictions. I think it was there were very very severe allegations about fraud and all sorts of things being made across a number of companies. It was a commercial case. And the one of the solicitors for the parties, um, despite knowing about the reporting restrictions and the usual warnings that are given, appears to have accidentally broadcast, I think it was the hearing, um, across about three different countries, um, and was subsequently called into court by a incredibly angry High Court judge um, to explain why why um why the big warning you get on those cases saying do not do not give out this information under any process had, had, had she, the, this list of thought it didn't extend to the ukraine or wherever it was that the, 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 the case had been broadcast to um so uh, crimes my area haven't done, haven't done that case but I, I would imagine that if as i said if you don't have sensible answers to how are you going to ensure that evidence get or evidence or whatever it is that information uh it, it is protected and it, it, then then there's really not <laughs> much point considering it uh remotely um unless there are any other questions um i think we should wrap up there not seeing any more questions coming through um but thank you very much to sean killian and beth for the very informative webinar and thank you very much for everybody that has joined us um, to listen. Again, if you have any questions, we're more than happy to answer your questions. Uh, Sean will send an email around later with our contact details um, if you want to speak to us. But thank you very much for joining us and I hope, we all hope that you have a lovely afternoon. <laughs>